Welcome to another session of History Bites. I want to look now at what I call the dissemination of knowledge for the colonist to have the ideas of republicanism and revolution. It was necessary for the spread of knowledge, information. John Adams said, the Puritans had a love of learning. Their civil and religious principles, therefore, conspired to propagate and perpetuate knowledge. For this purpose, they laid very early the foundations of colleges. Puritan influence cannot be overstated as far as its influence in education. Puritans made school mandatory, mandatory elementary schools in towns of 50 or more was a requirement. Also grammar schools, which was um, like preparatory for college, mandatory grammar schools in towns of 100 or more. These grammar schools emphasized the learning of Latin and Greek not only to be able to read, but also to speak and to write in Latin and Greek. And it was to prepare students for college. Man, uh, grammar, sorry, grammar schools uh, were only for young men. Uh, girls had to have elementary school, elementary education. Because of Puritan influence, the American colonists were more literate. A greater percentage of American colonists were literate than anywhere else in the world at that time. The colleges that would be founded, and of course the first college was founded by the Puritans in uh, 1636. Six years, only six years after they landed, in Massachusetts colony. They had created Harvard College, first college in North America. Colleges stressed the seven liberal arts, grammar, politics, rhetoric. Rhetoric, of course, is the art of persuasive speaking. Arithmetic, geometry, astronomy and music. Philosophy, both or I should say all three, uh, natural philosophy, moral philosophy, which was ethics, and mental philosophy. And of course, what was emphasized were the classical authors. That is, authors like uh, Plato, Aristotle, um, Cato, Publius, um, all of the ancient Greeks and Romans. So, Young men went to college in America. They learned those, they read, they studied the Greek and Latin scholars in the South. Now, Puritans were in the North, and their influence on education would be in New England. In the South, education was different. Um, the South was sparsely populated. We have these large plantations with perhaps a county seat, a town, maybe some small villages, but no cities, population was scattered. So there were no schools, and most children were homeschooled, schooled by their, by their parents, and not always by the mother, but also by the fathers. As young men got, um, older after they had learned the rudimentary elements of education. Their parents, if they were wealthy plantation owners, they would hire tutors to live in their homes and to teach their young men. And again, those who are wealthy, once the tutor has brought them up to speed for uh, college, prepared them for college, they might be sent to England or to Scotland to be educated in the colleges, like 
Benjamin Rush, who I've talked about, was educated in Edinburgh, Edinburgh University, some of the best universities, um, or let me say, two of the best universities and best scholars were in Scotland, Edinburgh and Glasgow. And many of those tutors that taught young men in the South came from Scotland. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, his, um, he had two tutors, an early tutor when he was quite young, and then a second tutor. They were both from Scotland. And one of the professors in the College of William and Mary in Virginia, George Wythe, was also Scottish. So the Scots really influenced education in the South in particular. Some of the other colleges other than Harvard, and on this slide, I have colleges that were created before the Revolution, before 1776. Harvard in Massachusetts, established by the Puritans, and most of these colleges were established by um, religions, by churches. So Harvard was established by the Puritans. The second college in the colonies was William and Mary, established in 19, in, sorry, in 1696 in Virginia, and it was established by the Anglicans. If you remember when we talked about the founding of the colonies, the people who, who went to the South, who created the culture and the society in the South were Anglican uh, aristocrats from the aristocratic class in England. So it was the Anglican Church that created the William and Mary College. Then Yale was established in 1701, that's in Connecticut, by the Puritans. Princeton, 1746 in New Jersey, uh, founded by the Presbyterians. And now Presbyterians were Calvinists, like Puritans were Calvinists. Um, Columbia or King's College, 1754 in New York, established by the Anglican. University of Pennsylvania, 1740s. This was non-sectarian, meaning that no one church um, established the college. University of Pennsylvania, uh, to a great extent, was influenced by Benjamin Franklin, but it was supported by both Anglicans and Quakers. Then Brown College, uh, or Rhode Island College, 1764, founded by the Baptists, and this was after the First Great Awakening, where Baptists became um, a dominant denomination. Uh, Rutgers, or Queens College, 1766 in New Jersey, established by the Dutch Reformed, again, Calvinist teachings, and Dartmouth in New Hampshire, 1769, established by Puritans. So as you can see by the list of colleges, that the Puritans had an overwhelming influence in the colleges and also uh, college education. The next slide has some images of some of those early colleges. Uh, the one on the top left is Harvard. That was in the, that image was made in the 1760s, uh, late 1760s. Um, the one right across from it is King's College. I'm not sure, um, I've forgotten uh, which these other colleges were, but these were all pre-revolutionary colleges in North America. So, dissemination of knowledge, spread of information uh, came through the schools and the colleges, but also from other avenues. Um, itinerant and public lecturers in the taverns. If you remember, I mentioned that a lot of times entertainment uh, would be lectures that would be uh, going through the countryside and they would uh, stop at a local tavern uh, to do, deliver lectures. And again, it might be on any number of topics. So public lecturers, 
um, help to spread information, to increase knowledge throughout the colonies, both north, south, middle colonies, um, had these itinerant or public lectures going through the countryside. But probably the biggest factor in the spread or the dissemination of knowledge was through books. Americans loved books. They read books. They devoured books. Here's a quote. This is in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. Um, the poorest laborer upon the shore of Delaware thinks himself entitled to deliver his sentiments in matters of religion or politics with as much freedom as the gentleman or scholar. Such is the prevailing taste for books of every kind that almost every man is a reader and by pronouncing sentence, right or wrong, upon the various publications that come in his way, puts himself upon a level in point of knowledge with their several authors. That was in 1772 by Jacob Duche, chaplain of Congress. Um, this is four years before America will declare independence, that he's talking about the poorest laborer reads and considers himself an expert on whatever topic the book is about, like scholars or the gentlemen. Immigrants who left England coming to America brought their books with them. Now this, think about this. Ships, these are small wooden ships, sail, sailing ships, and passengers were limited in what they could bring. And they, they know they're going to America to stay. And yet many of them find room to bring their books. For instance, um, William Brewster, who sailed on the Mayflower, he managed to make room to bring 400 books with him. He probably left other things in England he wanted his books with him. In 1680s, uh, Boston booksellers were some of the most important people in the colonies. Um, they sold books, and this is a list that comes from primary documents that uh, Boston booksellers in 1680s offered classical literature, books on history, on politics, on philosophy, science, theology, and a genre called Bell's Letters, which at that time period, everyone wrote letters. Men wrote letters, women wrote letters. And these Bell Letter were letters that were written not, not just uh, from one person to another, uh, giving gossip or talking about their, their occupations or, or what entertainments are doing, but they wrote these letters with pertinent information. And they knew that these letters would not only be read by the person to whom they sent it, but also they would often be printed in newspapers. And so many people are going to be reading those letters. And they're letters that contain a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. People who wanted new books, they would uh, get an agent, a man who is planning on sailing to Europe, and they would give them a list of books that they wanted that person to find and purchase for them. For instance, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, in the trips, several trips that he made back and forth across the Atlantic, he was an agent for other colonists who wanted him to find particular books for them, and he would bring them back. Men in the colonies, men particularly of some wealth, uh, were creating their own libraries. Uh, the governor of Connecticut, John Winthrop Jr., would accumulate over a thousand books in his own private library. Um, and that would have been in the uh, mid to late 1600s. John Adams 
accumulated over 3,000 books private in his private library. And now I know John Adams and many of these others well. I, I know also Thomas Jefferson. These men didn't just read a book one time. They read it several times. Um, I had an opportunity of spending a week in Boston several years ago uh, for seminars on John Adams. And we were able to visit the Boston Public Library, which held a lot of John Adams' own books. And so, as a researcher, I was able to um, look at some of John Adams' books. And it's quite a process. Um, you go in this part of the library that is only open to researchers, um, and you ask for the book you want. Uh, they bring it to you. You have to wear gloves. And they open the book for you, put it on kind of like a raised platform. But at any rate, in looking at his books, he, during this time period, they public, when they published a book, they left very wide margins. And John Adams probably wrote as much in the margins of the book as the author wrote in the book. Um, so they obviously studied, read, and reread, and had their opinions. Now, the way Thomas Jefferson did it, he didn't write in his books, but he kept what were called commonplace uh, books, which he would have, uh, it would be kind of like a notebook, and he would list the title and the author of a book, and then he would write his opinions as he was reading. He'd write his thoughts on what the author of the book was saying. So these private libraries were something that were, they were not just for looks, they were not just for prestige. But these are books that these men devoured. Jefferson had the largest personal library in America uh, by 1815. He had accumulated over 10,000 books in his private library. Now, if you compare that to some of the college libraries, for instance, uh, Harvard in 1723 only had 3,000 books. The public library in Boston was created in 1656. Lending libraries, subscription and circulating libraries, and again, um, Ben Franklin was very much influential in creating these libraries in the colonies. Another thought, uh, for colonists, the acquisition of knowledge through reading was a cherished activity and a resource. These were days, no telephones, no computers, no videos. Um, what they did for pleasure was to read. They did it for uh, practical purposes, for entertainment, uh, to increase their knowledge. Publishing in the colonies became very important, but it had kind of a slow start. Uh, the first things that were published would be broadsides. These were large single page printed sheets, uh, usually on average measure 22 and a half inches by 30 inches. They were sheets that would pertain information that would be of interest to the public. They would be prominently posted uh, in the taverns, um, in uh, a lot of times in the churches, where the public congregated. That's where they would post these broadsides. I have two examples there. One is a broadside about the great earthquake. Now remember, it took them a long time to get information. So this earthquake is something that occurred, I believe it was in South America. So it took a while before the information reached the colonies, but they created a broadside that would give information about that earthquake. Then the second one below that um, was about the appearance of a comet. In researching where I found these examples of broadsides, the, the one on the bottom there, the entire thing was not available. It just gave the image and a, a little bit of the printing underneath, but 
It was giving information about the appearance of a comet. Newspapers, the first American newspaper was not published until 1690. Most Americans that sought to read newspapers, they wanted newspapers from England or from Europe. They were more interested in what was going on in the courts of Europe and England than they were what was going on in their neighboring colonies. They wanted to know about the affairs of government, that is, government in England. They did have a postmaster which was appointed by the English government. John Campbell was the first, and he would be the man responsible for uh, seeing that mail was distributed. So in other words, uh, he might appoint different men to be post riders to carry the, the mail um, to different areas. By the 1760s, the number of newspapers, and I have here, I have no idea why I said the number doubled. Double from what? I'm sorry. That is um, lacking some important information there. But 1760s, the newspapers in the colonies really proliferated. One thing is because during that time period, uh, the French and Indian War had just ended, and the beginning of Americans' dissatisfaction with British policy is beginning. So newspapers, very crucial in the everyday life of the colonists. At the bottom of the slide is another quote, and this shows you that not everybody was happy about the dissemination of information or the dissemination of knowledge. Uh, 1671, Governor William Berkeley of Virginia wrote, I thank God there are no free schools, nor printing, and I hope we shall not have for these hundred years, for learning has brought disobedience and heresy and sects into the world, and printing has divulged them and liables against the best government. God keep us from both. So not everybody was, the authorities were not happy about how much the Americans were learning, how educated they were becoming. Here are some examples on the next slide of some of the early newspapers. Uh, as you can see, that doesn't look anything like the newspapers that we're accustomed to. Although I would have to ask, how many of you ever read a newspaper anymore? But no, bylines, no names of significant journalists. The one on the left, public occurrences, both, I'm sorry, I can't read it from here, um, but it gives a date. You're closer there watching this video. You can read the dates on those. The middle one, the Boston Newsletter and the Virginia Gazette. Lots of information, no images, no pictures, no bylines. Just lots of information. Thank you for watching this episode, and I hope you will come back. Our next episode, we'll be talking about the change or the evolution of religion in the colonies, which is a very significant part of life in the colonies. See you next time.